Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 29th of October and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 1st of November and we've seen more record highs again this week uh, for major US markets. US companies have once again uh, delivered numbers pretty much ahead of market expectations. Um, UK companies have also um, by and large managed to deliver some fairly decent numbers notably um, Reckitt Ben Kaiser who followed on from Unilever and Procter and Gamble the week before by posting improving, improvements in sales and what have you um, showing that despite rising inflationary pressures they were able to pass on price increases to consumers. We've also seen fairly decent numbers from the UK banks this week from Lloyds, from Barclays from HSBC. NatWest numbers slightly underwhelming. Um, they've slipped back this morning down around about 4% despite the fact that uh, they managed to boost profits from a year ago. Having said that, I think the decline in the share price is more down to the fact that profits were lower in Q3 than they were in Q2 and net interest margins were, were lower rather than higher, which was the case in the case of Lloyds Bank. Anyway, um, one thing, one notable thing that we have seen over the course of the past week or so is the FTSE 100 has broken towards the upside, broken above that 7190 area that I have been and I've identified um, over the course of the past few weeks as a fairly key level. Um, if we look at the lows from the 21st of October and the 18th of October, around about 7180, that I think remains the, net, the, the key support um, in light of the gains that we've seen thus far. As we're heading into the end of the week, we're also heading into the end of the month, so we could be seeing a little bit of profit taking on the back of that, and I think that potentially could be weighing on the FTSE 100 and equity markets more broadly. We're also seeing a little bit of weakness in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ um, over the disappointing reaction to the numbers from Amazon and Apple overnight and one of the key the, one of the key takeaways that we saw um, from those numbers was higher costs particularly in the case of Amazon and increased supply chain disruption in the case of Apple. Um, iPhone numbers for Apple came in below expectations around about 38 billion dollars. Um, we're expecting a number in the region of 41 billion dollars although sales of sales in services and iPads were better than expected and Mac sales also held up fairly well. And I think this goes to the point that um, while expectations around Apple's numbers are fairly high, um, let's, let's not forget Apple hasn't given any guidance for the past six quarters. So I think uh, market expectations were a little bit on the high side, but that's not to say that um, Apple still isn't a very, very good company. Unfortunately, they're having to contend with the same logistical problems that everyone else is. And as a consequence of that, um, they're not being able to ship as many iPhones or product as demand would dictate. And I think that is the key factor here. And they've identified it as a key factor over the course of the next um, six to nine months. Tim Cook himself said that um, the various construction, the various delays in supply chains have cost the cost company six billion dollars. While Amazon has said that higher costs are likely to push its cost base up in Q4 over the holiday season, up by another $4 billion in terms of extra staffing costs and the like. If you look at it over the course of the year, um, expenses, Amazon expenses have gone up from $12 billion to almost $20 billion over the course of the past two quarters. So that gives you an indication of the challenges being faced not only uh, by Amazon, but I think the markets more broadly, higher costs higher inflation and supply chain disruptions. So seeing um, significant uh, resistance up around 4,600 on the S&P 500, but let's not forget we're still near uh, we're still near record highs and while we're seeing a little bit of weakness today as we head into the end of the week and the end of the month, um, there's still very little sign that um, stock markets are losing their attractiveness to investors despite the fact that um, inflation expectations are rising and central banks are looking potentially at a modestly 
uh, um, nudging interest rates higher. Now, earlier this week, the Bank of Canada unexpectedly called a halt to its bond buying program, sending the Canadian dollar sharply higher. Um, and I think that's the narrative that I'm going to be looking out for over the course of the next week or so, because we've got three central bank meetings, having got past the European Central Bank, which was pretty underwhelming as normal, and where Christine Lagarde indicated that um, um, it wasn't for her to say whether or not market expectations of a Europe ECB rate hike um, next year were right or wrong. Certainly, we've seen a pickup in the euro from the lows um, earlier um, earlier this month, uh, around about um, 13th of October, but we are starting to run into resistance from these trend line highs uh, in May. So keeping on the 50-day moving average and this trend line resistance here as to ascertain whether or not we've seen the highs in euro dollar or whether or not the Federal Reserve will burst the euro's bubble and basically push the dollar back up after the declines over the course of the past few weeks. If we look at the CMC dollar index, we can see that borne out here. It's, it's heading towards a fairly key support level. And we can see that we've seen fairly gradual declines over the course of the past few weeks, but we still remain very much in the trend, the uptrend that we've been in over the course of the past few months. If we look at the lows down here and the peaks here, we've only seen a really modest pullback. and given the fact that we've got non-farm payrolls coming up, there, there could be an expectation that while the Fed is going to outline a tapering timetable at its meeting on Wednesday, I'll be surprised if there's a significantly hawkish tone from that meeting, but you just never know. So as we look ahead to the upcoming week, there are, I think, four key events that I've got my eye out for notwithstanding the earnings numbers that we've got coming out as well. First and foremost, non-farm payrolls. Tune in for the webinar then. Apologies for there not being one in October where we saw a big miss. Um, but ultimately, I think even though there was a big miss on that October payrolls number, sorry, the September payrolls number, um, that's not really altered the narrative when it comes to, to a tapering of asset purchases um, going to be outlined at... Um, at the upcoming meeting. So payrolls numbers, they've been a little bit of a letdown, if truth be told, um, for those who thought that the impending roll-off in stimulus measures on the 6th of September would herald a strong rebound in the US labor market. Since then, we've seen August payrolls come in at 366. That was adjusted higher. And when Powell suggested that a half decent jobs report would be the final piece of the jigsaw, jigsaw for tapering to start in November, I don't think he had a number of 194,000 jobs for September in mind. Nonetheless, whether or not the Fed starts tapering in November or announces a taper to start in December, I think the broader narrative is that it's going to start. And the bigger question is how quickly they roll it off. Um, and if tapering, you know, if, if tapering starts with around about $10 billion on um, treasuries and five billion dollars on U.S. treasuries, then I think that will be potentially um, a little bit on the dovish side. If, on the other hand, they come in higher than that, that could well be construed as particularly hawkish. So, keeping an eye on the um, payrolls numbers, expecting a number of around about 400, 425,000. Um, the U.S. labor market has got an unemployment rate of around about 4.8 percent saw a big fall there. The participation rate still remains fairly weak. I think what was particularly interesting, though, in the recent jobs numbers, the continuing claims, was the fact that we're now down at 2.2 million continuing claims. Pre-pandemic, we were trending at 1.7 million continuing claims. So we're only 500,000 above on the continuing claims than we were before the pandemic hit. So that suggests that we are getting a normalization in terms of the US labor market. The bigger concern for me is the fact that the participation rate is showing no signs of getting anywhere near back to the levels that we saw in, in February 2020, 63.7%. We're currently at 61.6%. 
So non-farm payrolls, that's the big number of the week. I'll be holding a webinar on that basis, and that will start at 1 p.m. on the 5th of November. We've also got the, obviously, we've got the Federal Reserve um, rate meeting. And again, timeline timeline for tapering. I think that's going to be the key to take away there. And whether or not we get a move in the dot plots, um, which currently suggest that the committee are evenly split when it comes for a rate hike in 2022. So we'll be keeping an eye on that as well. We've also got two other central bank rate meetings. We've got the Bank of England and we've got the RBA. Now, the RBA, I think what we've seen in, in Australian dollar yields has been particularly noteworthy, and particularly if we look at the Australian dollar. You know, there's been an awful lot of speculation that the RBA may look at start to raise rates from 0.1% where they are now to 0.25%. What's more broadly forgotten, though, is the way the RBA um, at the beginning of August, back in September rather, there'd been an expectation that they might look at delaying their decision to start tapering their weekly bond purchase program from 5 billion Aussie to 4 billion Aussie a week. Now, in the event, they basically extend, and it was due to end in November. Um, they were due to end their bond buying in November. Now, they didn't do that. They extended it into February on the basis that they felt that the lockdowns that were being imposed on the Australian dollar economy would merely delay the recovery, um, not um, undermine it completely. Now, with the RBNZ raising rates um, earlier in October, I think the narrative has shifted now in terms of when we start to see central banks push rates higher. And I think the speculation has shifted to the RBA. If you look at three-year yields, they've moved significantly higher um, and they're well above the levels that they were um, around about a month ago. They're currently around about 0.7, 0.75. So I think it's a remarkable turnaround from two months ago when markets were speculating about a delay to tapering. Now we're talking about the potential for ending the asset purchase program completely. And I think that could be a middle ground for the RBA as we look ahead to the 2nd of November meeting. The RBA, rather than raising rates, could end their asset purchase program um, as a means to signal a glide path to a potential rate rise going forward. Um, so that's something to, to, to keep an eye out for. A middle ground could be the RBA ends its asset purchase program. Um, will they raise rates? Based on what the RBN said, there's a good chance they could, but if they wanted to sort of strike a middle ground, they could potentially just end the bond buying program. Now, we're heading towards key resistance on the Aussie dollar. We can see it here. We've got the 200-day moving average. We've also got 50% retracement of the entire down move from 0.8 to 0.71. So this level here around about 75, 60, 75, 70, that's a key resistance level. We'll be paying particular attention to that over the course of the past few days, or over the next few days, I should say. Um, cable, Bank of England. Will the Bank of England raise rates um, in, the, in their November meeting when they basically set out the November inflation report. Well, if you look at UK two-year gilt yields, then a rate rise is already priced in. In fact, more than one rate rise is already priced in. And they sort of painted themselves into a corner. So I am expecting a rate rise between now and the end of the year. It's really just a question of, of when. The bigger question is how the Bank of England dials back the narrative of potentially interest rates or base rates up at 0.75 or 1% by the end of next year. You hear, well, we've heard an awful lot that the Bank of England is on the cusp of a policy mistake by looking at raising interest rates, but that same narrative is also telling the Federal Reserve that they're on the cusp of a policy mistake because they're not acting fast enough. Both of these arguments cannot be true. Okay, You can't criticize the Fed for not acting quickly enough at the same time as criticizing the Bank of England of acting too quickly. A rate rise of 0.15% to 0.25%, it's not the end of the world. And I think markets in some respects need to get a grip. Yes, market expectations for a rate rise 
are a little bit on the high side potentially in terms of what to expect by the end of next year but certainly i don't think an interest rate rise of 0.15 percent to 0.25 is the end of the world either it's how the central bank manages the message and certainly i think the change of narrative the shift in the narrative suggests that there is a growing concern about rising inflation expectations which recent events haven't changed we've already seen in Europe, German PPI prices at the highest level since the 1970s. You've got German CPI at 4.6%, the highest levels since 1992, when interest rates were 6.75%, not minus 0.5, which is where they are now. So, you know, a small, modest adjustment in interest rates isn't the end of the world. And I think sometimes it's very easy to get caught up and get, get too close so the narrative of the news flow. Sometimes it's good to take a step back. So what does that mean for cable? Well, we've got 50 day moving average, which is acting as support on the downside. We've got the 200 day moving average, which is the next key resistance. So 138.40.50, um, as well as these peaks here, they're the next key resistance level for me on cable. We've got modest support in and around 137.20, the 50 day moving average, and the market is looking a little bit on the overbought side, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't go higher. So for me, I think next week, keep an eye on the upside. I'm still moderately bullish cable, um, more on the basis of a little bit of dollar softness than anything else. But um, overall, still modest, modestly bullish. And Euro sterling, more importantly, um, has made a marginal new low around about 84. Significantly, it didn't take out the 84 level. It's prompted a little bit of a short squeeze. Now, we could squeeze back through 84.80 all the way back to the 200 day moving average. But overall, I'm still mindful of the opinion that the ECB is a long way from even considering the possibility of a rate hike, unlike say, for example, the Bank of England. So that should continue to push, put downward pressure on Euro sterling. And I think that for me is the, is, is the key takeaway. So that's the Bank of England meeting. We covered the RBA, we've got services, PMIs, and we've got payrolls data and let's not forget also that we've got services pmis which showed a bit of an improvement in terms of the uk numbers um, um, in the flash numbers um, from a couple of weeks ago so um, those are those are the key macro announcements as we look ahead to the um, upcoming week now let's look at some of the key earnings announcements i think i've covered pretty much everything in terms of um, the major markets let's just quickly have a look at the the Germany 40 as it is now. Seen a little bit of a roll off towards the end of the week. I think a large part of the reason that we've seen a little bit of weakness in the past few days is because we've got a little bit of end of week and end of month flow. But overall, um, we're still we're still on course for a fairly decent month, all told, for equity markets, even though that does potentially look a little bit like a, a bullish engulfing and we haven't taken out the previous highs. So there is a little bit of concern there in terms of the the DAX, but while we're above 15,000, then the outlook still remains fairly positive. So that, that, that potential monthly reversal does need a confirmation. And let's not forget that the S&P showed a similarly negative monthly reversal earlier this year, and we've gone on to make new record highs. So it's important to understand that these sorts of reversals always need confirmation and we didn't get that on the s p 500 they're early warnings but they don't necessarily signal um, the potential for a sharp reversal all reversal candlestick patterns need confirmation and it's important to remember that okay so let's look at um, earnings numbers we heard from royal dutch shell earlier this week and by all accounts they're pretty disappointing numbers when you've got record natural gas prices in Europe and you've got seven year highs natural gas prices um, in the US and oil prices are at multi year highs. You don't expect Shell to um, miss profit expectations and more than that, see them come in below the levels that they did in Q2. And I think this is the key. I think this is the key conundrum that markets are wrestling with. How do oil majors who rely so much on legacy fossil fuels um, transition to a much lower margin of renewables and more importantly what happens when 
the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. And I think that was one of the one of the problems with respect to to Shell's numbers is that even with the disruption of Hurricane Ida, they were unable to really generate the type of profits that you'd normally expect from um, from the higher prices that we've seen over the course of the past quarter. And BP is going to be faced with similar problems. You know, we've seen a fairly decent round in the BP share price. We are now, now starting to see a little bit of rollover. Um, the key support level for me is that 345 area, which we've managed to hold above thus far. Certainly there is much more potential, I think, in terms of BP um, for to see further gains. Um, you know, they, they, they in, in the first half of this year, replacement cost profit um, came in at the best level since 2019, um, as well as the company increasing its dividends. And they did go on to say that oil prices are $60. They're scoped to deliver buybacks of $1 billion a quarter. So I think given the fact that we've seen um, oil prices well above that, um, then really the expectation is they should do very well indeed. But it needs to use this surplus cash well. Um, and recycling it to shareholders, you know, just doesn't cut it in my book. There is going to be an awful lot more investment needed to be done in its performing while transforming strategy. But it needs to prove to shareholders in the market it can transition to renewables in a way that doesn't hammer its margins. So it needs to use the available capital in a much better way. Now, I recently signed an MOU with Piaggio to explore charging stations in India. But I think the real challenge is, and I think this is just as true for Shell as it is for BP, it's, it's grid capacity. And at the moment, you know, you can have as many charging points as you like, and you can, you know, car makers, also makers can sell as many electric cars as they like. But unless you upgrade the grid, then these oil companies are not going to be able to generate the revenues from the, the, the charging points that they push out there. So solar, re renewables, um, you know, wind power and what have you, um, that's not the only game in town. And certainly the answer isn't um, with respect to Shell to spin off the legacy business because it's the legacy business that's going to fund the transition. So there needs to be a certain element crossover. So be paying particular attention to BP's numbers when they come out on the 2nd of November, big oil in particular. We've also got next um, retail. One of the few retailers that's done very, very well over the course of the past um, few months, upgrading guidance on a fairly regular basis. But as we heard from Amazon, we're seeing increased costs, which are likely to impact profits going forward. So um, management upgraded four year guidance up to 800 million at the last set of numbers. Um, and that's a five year high. Um, so Simon Wolfson, CEO, did warn about the risks of longer delivery times in the lead up to Christmas. Um, stock levels are down 12% compared to pre-pandemic. They were coping. Costs are likely to go up as warehouse space becomes more expensive. So this week's Q3 numbers from next do run the risk that we could see a potential downgrade as we look towards the Christmas period. Amazon has pointed to that, um, and it could be something to watch out for as we look ahead to the rest of the year. Shares are still up on the year, still made really decent progress, but we could start to see a few headwinds in the, in the, in the guise of higher costs. We've also got Sainsbury's numbers due out. And they've been basically making some fairly decent gains so far year to date. An awful lot of that has been on speculation about m and in the make in the wake of the Morrison's um, takeover, which finally completed earlier this month, and which has seen Dark Trace take its place in the FTSE 100. Petrol shortages 
also saw um, could well have seen an uplift in their fuel sales. The flip side to that um, could have seen shoppers reduce the number of visits to supermarkets as a result of that, which could mean bigger shops, but overall fewer visits. Also online sales. Um, how does how, how has Argos done? Um, now that the economy has started to reopen. Um, they were a particular um, disappointer, a disappointment in the last quarterly numbers. Um, but Sainsbury's did upgrade their profit forecasts for the year from 620 million to 660 million. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not they stick with that guidance. And also, more importantly, what their guidance is for the Christmas period going forward. So um, that's those numbers are due on the 4th of November. We've also got IAG. Um, IAG's numbers are due out. They've had a pretty poor year, started off really optimistically um, at the start of the year in the hope that restrictions would get eased fairly quickly. Um, obviously, that hasn't proved to be the case. And as we look at the way the share prices rallied in early September, an awful lot of that early reopening enthusiasm has dissipated somewhat. So it continues to be a challenging environment in Q2. IAG reported an operating loss of over 1 billion euros. Um, uh, it said that it's only planning on resuming 45% of its 2019 capacity in Q3. And they've, they, they haven't offered a financial outlook for the rest of the year. So even though we've seen US and UK travel restrictions getting eased um, in early November and travel restrictions have pretty much been lifted across the board, um, the, the rise in infections in Asia is obviously going to temper expectations with respect to business travel and obviously the recent UK budget and the imposition of higher surcharges, air passenger duty surcharges, easy for me to say, on long haul flights could will impact the long haul um, as opposed to short haul where they've been dropped. But, you know, the, it's, a, it's a fairly low bar for AIG, which would suggest that potentially there is potential for further, there is potential for further upside going forward. Um, we've also got numbers out from AMC, potentially AMC Entertainment, is they're slated for the 2nd of November, but they could get pushed to the 9th. Um, so, um, looking at revenues there, the new No Time to Die James Bond film um, could well have seen a significant uplift there as people venture back to the cinema. And certainly the anecdotal evidence would suggest that um, that has got people back into movie theatres, certainly on both sides of the Atlantic. So even if we don't get those numbers on the 2nd of November, well, I'll be paying particular attention to them if they come out the following week. We've also got Pfizer, um, their Q3 numbers. They've been cleaning up along with BioNTech on the vaccine front. At its last set of numbers, um, Pfizer um, raised its forecast for vaccine sales to $33.5 billion for this year from $26 billion. Now, we could see another upgrade to that guidance at um, the Q3 numbers, which are due out on the 2nd of November. Revenue estimates for 2021 are currently sitting at $74 billion with adjusted net income expected to double to $21 billion. Well, when you consider that Pfizer's total revenue in 2020 was $42 billion, that gives you an indication of how important um, the vaccine is. Now, the share price did take a little bit of a tumble along with Moderna on the back of that news from Merck that was that said that they done successful tests on an antiviral pill for COVID-19. So that could be a headwind, particularly if those trials end up being successful and the um, pill gets ratified. Let's face it, I'd much rather take a pill than get a jab in my arm. So same applies for Moderna on the 4th of November. We've seen a little bit of a modest tick back in the share price on the basis of that, um, that Maersk news, but also concerns about myocarditis risk in younger, uh, in, in younger cohorts, um, adolescents, 
with respect to the Moderna jab there. Now, a year ago, Moderna generated $158 million in revenues. This year, we can expect to see a number in excess of $6.2 billion, while profits are expected to rise to $9.33 a share. So paying particular attention to the revenue numbers there. And um, more importantly, I think in terms of whether or not um, uh, Moderna will uh, look at potentially returning money to shareholders. I mean, when, when I looked at the Q2 numbers, um, revenue was at 4.4 billion. The vaccine contributed 4.2 billion of that number, and we're expecting a number of 6.2 billion for this quarter. So an, a, a $2 billion increase in quarterly revenues for Moderna. That's quite something. Um, so that's pretty much, I think that's pretty much it. Other numbers that are due out, Aruba, Q3 numbers on the 4th, Peloton, Q1 numbers on the 4th. And we've also got um, BT Group as well. But as with anything with this, this, sort, of with this sort of stuff, it's all about the timing. And I think I've gone on um, for long enough. So just to recap, um, Bank of England, RBA, Federal Reserve, non-farm payrolls, the key macro numbers for next week. Don't forget to tune in to the webinar on the 5th of November, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. with me. Um, until such times, um, have a great week. Have a great weekend and speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks very much for listening.